Does this work? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, great. Then, if you're all set up, uh, well, thank you all for your interest and uh, uh, making time to, to come to listen uh, to my talk. I entitled it Biodiversity Monitoring from Airborne Environmental DNA uh, with the subtitle Revolutionary or Delusional. And um, as you, spoiler alert, um, as you can guess, we'll probably uh, land somewhere in the middle, although I tend to think that it has a um, great potential, uh, but I'll try to uh, walk you through, uh, give you some background and uh, walk you through the current studies, mine and those of others, um, and uh, what's next, what we need to test um, uh, to get an answer to this question, whether or not it's really something that could revolutionize biodiversity monitoring or where it could fit in. But as a background, uh, first, sorry, I can't seem to be switching slides. Um, a quick reminder, what is environmental DNA? So environmental DNA, in its broadest definition, is all DNA that's collected from an environment, which includes also full organisms. Uh, a more operational uh, definition is DNA traces that species leave behind in the environment. So, uh, we can take an sample of water typically, and uh, this sample will contain DNA of organisms living in that water and close to the water. And uh, with molecular methods, we can amplify certain gene regions and compare them to reference databases, which will give us a list of species that left the DNA behind in this environment. So it's a sort of remote sensing technique, uh, which allows us to observe the species without actually seeing the individuals. Environmental DNA is uh, easily two decades old by now and uh, has found a lot of powerful applications. Uh, but um, if you know the literature, uh, you will realize that most of these have been aquatic. Um, it has been successfully applied to detect rare species for um, to, to, to do biomonitoring, uh, to assess the impacts of industrial uh, accidents or, or just um, industrial um, activities, but all these uh, breakthroughs has usually been occurring in water and which much, much less so on land. And the reason for that is that water is an aqueous matrix, which is well mixed, which means that uh, you can take a liter of water from somewhere and it will contain uh, a mixture of DNA uh, from all the species or maybe a lot of species that live in this lake or in this in this area, plus also species that live in the surroundings uh, whose DNA has been brought into the water. Terrestrial DNA is different because and um, terrestrial, uh, terrestrial DNA is different in the sense that um, most studies who have uh, looked at, for example, honey for uh, studying uh, plant biodiversity or um, at leaves to study, late, uh, to study ungulates, uh, these are species-species interactions. So we can get the DNA of plants that the insects have visited, or we can take a topsoil sample, which might be a more integrated sample. But again, um, it's really hard to get an integrated topsoil sample. We need to take a lot of topsoil samples to really get a good representative integrated sample of an environment. But if you think about it, air and the atmosphere surrounding uh, the globe is sort of as the ocean that covers the earth, right? Uh, air is also liquid and uh, it's well mixed, so it has a potential uh, to be this matrix um, that contains the DNA signal from all species living in a certain area. And if you look at what size class eDNA usually comes in, can you see my mouse if I do this? You should be, right? Um, so um, most eDNA comes in the size class below 100 micrometer and even below 10 micrometer. And particles below 10 micrometer and even below 100 micrometer stay airborne for a certain amount of time. So there's the potential that these particles once they are in the air, they stay in the air, and we can sample them from the air. Taking a step back, uh, 
looking or looking more in detail into these particles, which are called bioaerosols. So there's aerosols uh, that are of biological origin. They come in three broad classes. So the first class is living organisms, that's viruses, COVID, that's airborne, uh, bacteria, microalgae, and unicellular fungi, which uh, either get transported through the air or even, or even live in the air. And the field of aerobiology has traditionally studied these this fraction of bioaerial souls and also more recently with molecular methods. The second uh, type of bioaerial souls that you have are propagules. So these are um, entities designed to uh, disperse through the air, namely mostly pollen for plants and fungal spores, where pollen are on the large end, they usually come into the size class of 20 to 50 micrometers, but especially fungal spores uh, fall right in uh, to the size class um, with a size of two to five micrometer. And there have been studies, uh, as I said two here, they have uh, used pollen sampling um, to, uh, to assess uh, pollen uh, for, for allergy uh, predictions mostly, and uh, but also um, there's a groundbreaking study using spore sampling um, that really shows that you can get a good impression of regional fungal diversity from spore samples. The third fraction of uh, bioaerosols is the most exciting one, I'd argue, and that's the one what all the fuss is about, uh, because that's extra extra organism in DNA, uh, which is released from excretion, cell fragments, tissue fragments, and maybe DNA bound to organic and inorganic particles. And this fraction of DNA has the potential to contain all DNA uh, or DNA from all organisms, because all organisms that live in the environment, they will lose DNA, which has the potential to be aerosolized and uh, be kept from the air. And so last year, there have been a few studies, um, a range of studies published uh, in very close temporal proximity to each other that have targeted this fraction to show that uh, we can use it to detect different organisms group from DNA sample from the air. And there have been two studies. They've been conducted, uh, conducted in zoos uh, by Christina Lungard and colleagues and Elizabeth Claire and colleagues. And um, I think uh, Christina and Christine um, have been giving a seminar in the seminar series uh, last um, a few months ago. And we have shown that we could uh, detect insect DNA uh, from samples taken in the field. And uh, Mark Johnson, then PhD student of uh, Matthew Barnes from Texas, has shown that with passive samplers, uh, they could detect uh, quite a lot of airborne eDNA from plants and not only from pollen. Um, and I'll show you some of their results uh, later. And another group from, from Japan had also published a small uh, study showing uh, similar than we that insect DNA could be collected from the air. And I just want to make one more comment uh, on this slide because um, it illustrates, or it's better illustrative of a, of a point that I like to, to make, uh, because we usually recount uh, science as um, a series of breakthroughs, uh, usually by single individuals or maybe groups. Uh, but there's a really nice example I find of um, how science moves as with the knowledge frontier. And uh, at some point, there's just a breakthrough is ripe. Uh, in a sense, and a lot of people, a lot of groups have the same idea at the same time. And if uh, we wouldn't have done it, others probably would have. And it's interestingly uh, interesting that talking to to some of the people who have been in the eDNA field for a while, um, this has been tried before, it just doesn't didn't work very well. So they were before that time, and um, here we are. <laughs> so this got uh, quite a bit of attention. And you might have uh, heard of it. Um, and this might be the reason why you're here. And so what is this all about? Well, um, first I want to talk to you, I, I will present you the results. Uh, I will present you our study and then I will present um, a bit more about ongoing and future research. 
And so, um, as Sarah introduced, when I was in Lund, uh, I was working with insects and quickly realizing, because this department in Lund uh, works a lot um, with insects, but I quickly realized that they A, worked mostly with two groups of insects only, butterflies and bees, wild bees. And uh, second, that uh, insect monitoring was incredibly hard, even for these groups, but especially for all the other groups. So I had recently analyzed an eDNA, uh, a trusted eDNA data set uh, for a colleague that some of you uh, might know, Camilla uh, Duarte, that had uh, taken topsoil samples uh, from the tropics and analyzed these for eDNA. And um, I thought, well, if the DNA is in the topsoil, it probably has fallen down there from or settled from the air. So what we really should do is um, maybe design some sort of eDNA trap that uh, would allow us to also take a defined sample where we know when it starts, where it ends. Um, so I started talking to, to colleagues and they referred me to uh, Jakob, which is a bioaerosol scientist at Lund University. And he said, no, well, that's not how we sample aerosols. Uh, we set them out from the air, there's active samplers, there's a whole field of research. And um, I left uh, his office with this um, sampler, which is a Coriolis uh, sampler. And he just uh, gave it to me and told me, well, go and try it out. Uh, sounds really nice, would be interesting. And so we did. And I got a master student, Daniela, uh, Natalie Danielson, sorry, uh, who um, helped me do this work. And uh, we went to five sites in southern Sweden. So Lund is here, Gothenburg is a bit more up here. And uh, what these five sites had in common is that other projects were doing insect monitoring with other methods on these sites. So we had something uh, to compare our results to. And explicitly these sites in the, in the small land, Astrid Lindgren land, they were doing, or we were doing uh, pollinator uh, surveys, bees and butterflies. Uh, then here on the roofs of the, of the university, a colleague runs a moss trap, a light trap for moss. And in the beach forest, uh, there were some MLS traps, although ultimately uh, we couldn't compare our results to the MLS traps because those results weren't ready yet. And so we went out, took some samples, maybe a quick Amanda, these, uh, the, the, the way they work here is you suck in the air, it swirls the air through this cone and it pushes the particles into the liquid. Uh, so you're left with your particles in your sampling liquid, which was just water fast. And uh, then you can um, filter that uh, sampling liquid on a normal filter and treat it as a normal eDNA sample. So filter it, extract DNA, and then use PCR to target your groups of interest, which was insects first. So we used two sets of primers, uh, 16S and CO1, um, to target the insects. So this is background. Um, it's very small sample, so it's only 15 uh, minutes, one sample we pulled, uh, sorry, 10 minutes, one sample, we pulled up to three samples, so 30 minutes in total. And, um, it sucks air at 300 years per minute. But so it totally comes around uh, only about three cubic meter of air uh, that is sampled in one of these tubes. So it's not that much. What do we find? Um, let me show you some pictures. Um, interestingly, so it worked. It worked and it didn't work. It worked quite well uh, because we find something. This is exciting. Uh, so it's a real proof of concept study, and we found uh, species from all the four large orders, so the, the Hymenoptera, um, the bees and the ants, the wasp bees and the ants, the diptera, so the flies, uh, the coleoptera, which is the beetles, uh, the lepidoptera, uh, which are the butterflies, and moss, uh, but also uh, we got DNA from spiders or arachnida. Um, and some soil organisms. So here's springtail, columbella, and um, even gastropods, which were certainly not airborne, uh, but it's topsoil, it prob probably gets resuspended, and also from a range of uh, vertebrates. 
And uh, the pictures I show you here, those are some examples for which we have certain speech identification, so their DNA we found in our samples. So it's quite cool. And if you look across the different taxa now and across the different primers, um, one thing you will see is that for the C1 primer, which we usually use to target the insects, um, we, if you use it on air eDNA sample, we mostly get fungi, uh, which is a problem because these primers have been designed to capture as many insects as possible. But because in eDNA sample, most DNA is fungi, where they capture fungi, and fungi also have CO1 genes, um, the samples tend to get dominated by fungi. So this is one point. There's a lot of optimization to be done. But uh, we do find, uh, we did, across all samples, we found over 100 um, astropod species. And if you break it down, um, yeah, we find um, 35 species of lice, um, close to 20 species of beetles, um, 15 species or 13 species maybe of uh, butterflies, actually mostly moss. I don't think we detect, uh, detect any uh, butterflies. But in general, so what we showed in this proof of concept study is that it worked. If you compare it now to the traditional um, sampling, it shows that it works in the sense that we get insects. It doesn't work out of the box better than the traditional monitoring for the species group that was targeted. So if you compare it to only the moss, um, you see that in the same the light trapping, so daily night trapping for 10 days, um, captured 48 different moss species, and uh, eDNA uh, captured a total across both primer pairs, uh, captured nine moss species, four of which were shared with the um, with the light trapping. At the pollinator side, we didn't capture any of the bees, wild bees or butterflies with the eDNA, um, but four most that were missed by the uh, butterfly survey if we um, break it down to Lepidoptera. However, and that's often the case with eDNA, um, if we expand our focus and look at all astropods, the picture changes. So we actually captured more astropods uh, than the light traps, Obviously, the light traps are also only designed to capture moss. Um, but then we got quite a few. And same picture, although the athletic stream at the pollinator side, we were also captured definitely more isopods, not more than the traditional survey, but more isopods than uh, if we only restricted to bees and butterflies. So far for other results, for our results, a quick overview of the uh, results from the other uh, research group. So there's these um, twin papers from uh, Christine and Elizabeth that have both designed very similar studies at the same time, looking at uh, vertebrates, detecting vertebrates from zoos. And similar to us, uh, they find that um, they can detect a lot of vertebrates from the samples that they can uh, take, which was especially fascinating in the in the case of Claire at all, because if you look in the methods, um, they use Derivic filters to sampling air. And with a normal um, peristaltic pump, which is normally used to, to pump water. And so they sample at a rate of, um, I think I calculated, they come out, one sample is, is uh, at the, the sample at a rate of nine liters per minute and they run for uh, 30 minutes. Um, so they sampled very low amount of air and still got um, DNA from quite a few species. But of course, um, in zoos, DNA accumulates. So the, it might be much, much higher in zoos than it is in natural um, environments. Um, but there's a new preprint out uh, from Christine who sampled in the um, forest in, in, in Denmark um, and across 140, uh, 143 airborne eDNA samples, quite a lot of field replication, they did detect 64 vertebrate taxa, um, excitingly shown that it also works in the wild, which corroborates the results we had. We also could detect uh, vertebrates in our samples, which are not collected from the zoos. 
for plants, again, Johnson et al. Um, has done a, a few studies and the last one, the largest one, showing that across a year, um, deploying this grid of nine passive samplers, which look like this here, where the wind blows in with more dust traps, usually used in geological surveys to study soil erosion. But across these uh, samplers, they found more species with eDNA than with two traditional surveys um, that sampled this whole field um, twice, or surveyed this, this whole field uh, at two occasions. So again, uh, promising results. So these were the proof of concept studies. And um, I think we only get away with them also once. We showed that it works, uh, but now we need to show uh, that the results are useful. Because one question um, that everybody has, that you probably also had already, is, uh, well, great, you capture eDNA, but where does it come from? And it's a, it's a good question, because if you look at these trace plot on the left side, um, this is the air masses that reach one of our sampling points um, at one of our sampling dates. And I think it's back traced for, I think it's back traced 24 hour, uh, 48 hours, might even be only 24 hours. But you can see that the air masses uh, that reach our sampling point uh, came from as far away as the, the UK, um, central Germany, or Poland to the east. So covering a huge area. And if the sample would be a mixture of DNA released anywhere in this area, arguably, it might not be very useful. However, um, if we looked at our data and we clustered them by species composition, uh, the different sites, and admittingly, this is mostly based on fungi because they dominated the samples. Um, the, 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 the sites cluster quite well together, even though they're only a few kilometers apart in some cases. So this would argue that the airborne eDNA signal is um, rather regional and uh, might very well be uh, useful to distinguish uh, different local or regional uh, biodiversities. So how do we reconcile this? Well, the particles uh, get transported um, by, the, by the air masses, but they also get deposited um, through dry deposition, which is just settling or washed out by rain. And uh, this dry deposition is a function of the size of the particle. And it's very different uh, for particles in the size range of uh, five to 20 micrometers than for particles in the size range of 0.2 uh, to maybe one or two micrometers. And if you plot the same plot and add some wind, like five meters per second, like breeze, uh, you can see that the particles um, in the size range of 20 or 10 micrometers, in this very, very simple model here, um, they traveled maybe a few kilometers, maybe up to uh, 50 or something, while in three days to 72 hours, um, while the smaller particles uh, could easily travel um, over a thousand kilometers and basically don't settle at all. So one question we need to answer is what size does our eDNA uh, come in? And this is one experiment we did. And uh, so I borrowed another uh, sampler, an aerosol sampler, because again, this is great. Like aerosol science is an established research field. They have figured out a lot of things that we don't need uh, to figure out how to do. And uh, one of these things is size fractionated sampling, which interestingly works, is easier with, with aerosols than it is with, uh, with water samples. And so uh, the way this works, there's an impactor. And um, the way this works is it channels air through these holes here. So here's the pattern that is, it, it, that is the result of the holes, but it channels air through these different chambers. And um, by modulating the, 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 the size of the hole, uh, you modulate the speed of the air. And by modulating the speed, um, you will have particles of different size being deposited in the different 
uh, chambers, the so-called impactor. And it gives like this really neat indicate uh, patterns, which are the iris rules collected on a three day period, 72 hours across eight size fractions. And we let it run for 12 days, um, which gave us four samples and uh, two times, um, one in autumn and one in spring. And we analyzed the DNA with the Luray primers, C1 primers, to look at what we find in different size fractions. And what we find is quite interesting. So uh, split down by the largest groups, the arthropods, the ascomycota, uh, which is like the molds um, and the yeasts, but also the morals, for example, and then the basic mycota, which is all your, all your other mushrooms, the ones you usually want to find and eat. Um, we see on the left here um, the species richness in the different size classes. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is that uh, in the size class below one micrometer, so the particles uh, that really never settled here and can travel very large distances, we have basically no DNA. And even below two micrometer, we have only uh, very few. So here, uh, I show you the plot with OTU richness. I realized just before I started presenting that the plot with DNA concentration was missing, but let me tell you, it looks very similar. You know, there's actually quite a decent correlation between uh, DNA concentration and OTU richness for the different groups. And so what we also see here is that um, the peak of the uh, diversity is in the size fractions of maybe two to eight micrometers here uh, with uh, some interesting patterns um, between between seasons. It seems like in that the the, uh, the peak is a bit higher in spring uh, than it was in fall, but mind you, it was only two sampling periods, we didn't replicate season. So it was just observation at this point. But it also shows that uh, in the highest size fraction above eight micrometer, um, we find actually uh, not that much or not, the, the, the bulk is in the lower size fraction. And this is good news, I would say, for, for airborne eDNA, because one, it's not in a very small size fraction, which might be completely mixed and uh, transported very far. And two, it's also not in the very large size fraction, which uh, might um, be airborne only very short time and therefore not integrate. So I'd say these results are promising in terms of um, EDN, airborne eDNA giving us um, a good regional sample solely based on the size fraction here. Um, if we, um, of course, then the next question is about uh, the, the degradation of DNA in the air, and this is something that uh, will need to be addressed, which we haven't looked at yet. Again, um, just a, a quick comparison of this of these results with the with what with the graph that I showed you previously about uh, the size fraction of eDNA. So yeah, this this works quite well. This is where most eDNA is, also like whole cells, maybe organelles. Uh, and, and small organisms. Um, and it's what we call the core size fraction aerosol. So it's also corroborated by um, textbook aerosol theory that this is the size fraction that it should be in. So this fits together. This is quite cool. Another question is now that we know it's out there, it's about in the right size fraction, is how can we sample it best? And because it's such a big field, aerosol sciences, um, and spore trapping and pollen trapping has been for a while. There's a lot of ways uh, we can sample it. This, these are, this is the Burkhardt sampler that is used, for example, in a live project to sample spores. And it's a dry cyclone sampler, so it samples spores directly into a small epinerve tube. This is a vacuum cleaner, which uh, samples into water, has very high flow rate and is a very efficient sampler. Um, this is a sampler I showed you previously, which is like a liquid cyclone sampler because it cycles the air here through and uh, liquid. So this is a dry cyclone, this is a liquid cyclone. Here is a filter on top. This is dust. There's an electrostatic precipitator, um, which attracts the particles to electrical charge plates. We can take them apart and then take the particles off the plate. 
This is a sampler, which is just a computer fan with three printed housing on top of it, which um, Christine and Christina uh, designed, and a HEPA filter, which you can buy for your AC. And um, also draws air, is very cheap to build, also draws air at 60 liters per minute, um, and can be battery op operated for a long time. And then you have also all the passive samplers. So there's just a sedimentation uh, plate used by some colleagues here to collect mushrooms and um, or fungal spores. And uh, it's just a glass fiber filter on which spores sediment. And this is a modified Wilson and Cook trap. It's a very fancy word for a jar with two pipes going in. And uh, the air goes in here. Um, and because the expanse in the pipes, the particles, the, the air calms down sort of, and the particles can settle and then escape it. So what we did this summer, but yeah, uh, the, the samplers differ widely in terms of uh, how much air they capture, how long they can uh, they can sample the sediment, these, these passive samplers, you leave them out for two weeks. Um, for some of these, you need generators. Uh, some can be operated on battery uh for up to 24 hours so what we did the sample uh the summer is we took the samplers out in the field and compared them at uh, and comp compared them at eight different sites where a lot of biodiversity data will be uh, have been collected for other purposes and so we will compare uh these samplers and also the passive samplers uh to see um which ones might uh, collect the most eDNA, both for, uh, we will be looking at insects, but also with colleagues, colleagues will be looking at bacteria, at plants, and at fungi, and vertebrates probably too. So this should be a comprehensive first assessment. It's really hard. We cannot do like all possible combination of all possible samplers, but it should give us an idea um, if any of these solutions um, and I root, for example, for the for the sampler from uh, um, Christina Christina, which seemed to work really well. To to give us a further advice how we should go about uh, sampling eDNA. And then uh, this is for the uh, for the method development uh, part in this last part. Um, I would like to share with you uh, one other part um, of my project here. And uh, this is to use sample networks that already exist. And because if you start thinking about um, that we want to filter DNA from the air, well, there is a lot of uh, things that do that already. Um, HEPA filters uh, do this in restaurants and um, in particular, um, we monitor particulate matter. So PM10 Feinstaub uh, for the German speakers among you, who, uh, which is a, a health risk. So countries will uh, have networks of samplers to monitor particulate matter, and these networks um, filter them traditionally on glass fiber filters. So. Um, in Switzerland, but also in other countries, there's an up and running network of uh, of particulate matter filter stations, which filter um, anywhere between every day to 30, uh, 30 filters a week. And uh, with very high flow rate filters, uh, so it's 700 liters per minute, um, I think the flow rate of 500 liters per minute, and it's a 24 hour uh, period on which which is integrated on one filter, so very large quantities of air. And in Switzerland, they even uh, some networks store these filters uh, frozen, so we have access to the filter archive uh, going back to 2011. And uh, we're in the process of preparing uh, 2,000 filters uh, from 2011 to 2020 from 10 different stations from the eastern part of Switzerland here. 30 filters per year. Not all stations have filters every year, but in total, I said, um, just 1,000 filters, which we will analyze uh, with a tree of lab approach to look at 
um, arthropods, vertebrates, fungi, and also bacteria, because it has the potential to really capture this integrated signal um, of DNA in the area. And especially, and now I'm talking about future plants, um, these things can be uh, combined with uh, other technologies again. Like, so uh, we have for weather models, um, we have very good models that uh, uh, that that uh, model uh, particle dispersion in um, yeah uh, we we have very good models models particle dispersion and uh, these these models um, could uh, can backtrace um, for from where a sample comes that we sampled so if you have a, a sample that integrates a twenty four hour period in one sample location, we can get a footprint from where uh, the particles reaching that sampler uh, might have come from. So we might be able, and again, this is uh, the potential uh, there is, we haven't tried this yet, to uh, spatially attribute the DNA the, that we sample to a certain area. And then by integrating many samples, um, have a surveillance network co-opt an existing particulate matter monitoring network as a eDNA biodiversity uh, surveillance network. So this is, of course, a bit pan sky, but I think it's very um, interesting in terms of the potential it has to survey large areas um, efficiently. And I think this is where biodiversity monitoring today is stuck especially when we talk about um, surveying across the tree of life, across a lot of different groups. Okay, and with that, um, I can mention uh, one other thing we're involved in. Um, so there is also the XPRIZE, I don't know if some people of you were familiar with this, but it's a competition, well, it's an organization that makes competition, but it's the XPRIZE Rainforest, which in particular, it's a competition um, that calls for the surveying of uh, one hectare of tropical rainforest within, uh, I think, 48 hours with uh, 72 hours to analyze the data on site. And, uh, uh, and, and the, the, the plot cannot be accessed. So it's, only, it's all by, by remote uh, sensing. And uh, we are also uh, collaborating, we are part of a team um, integrating eDNA with other um, remote sensing uh, technologies to survey uh, biodiversity, uh, to try to, to, to find ways to survey the biodiversity remotely um, in the tropical rainforest. So we're really excited about that too and see whether in the tropics um, airborne sampling um, could work too, which is very different. Um, conditions, of course, which uh, depending on the season, daily rainfalls, and so a lot of wet deposition of particles and the added challenge to somehow access the air that is in the canopy. Okay, and with that, um, and a nice picture of a drone that we also took out in the field this summer, um, I would like to uh, thank all my collaborators who are doing this work with me. So on the, on the right side, um, as the people from Lund University on the left side here, uh, Christy, of course, my PI, and uh, also uh, the collaborators across ETH uh, that yeah, have taken interest in this project and joined it, and I'm really grateful for that. And uh, with that, um, I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Fabian. This was a very nice talk. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing so we can go back to the presenter. Yeah. Do we have any questions?